Please welcome uh, Pini here on stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for about 10, 15 of you for showing up. Um, I'm going to talk about containers history and a bit of future and all kind of other things. Not technical at all. Um, so first, actually, how many use Docker? Just to set the stage, one, Docker, microservices, <laughs> microservices, serverless. Okay, same one. Okay, I'll, I'll be talking to you most of the time. Uh, right, so this is obviously a computer. Who knows where this typical computer is produced? Where? In China. It, it's the typical answer I get uh, when I do this talk. It's actually produced everywhere. This is a typical supply chain for a single computer, which probably not even full because it goes further into producers of raw materials and all kinds of other things. So actually a single computer produced by thousands of different companies, millions of different people. And the reason this, this exists is essentially because of this man. And this man, the name is Malcolm McLean, and he's essentially the one who not invented, but made physical containers popular. It happened in 1950s, 56 or so. Um, essentially, he sold his uh, truck company and uh, started a shipping company. He bought an, another shipping company, and he started using containers for actually on the market for 30, 40 years already, but he said everything we're going to do is going to be in containers. Of course, at that point, people said it's totally stupid, it's not going to work. Like, what's the point of it? If you, you, you can put it in the ship, or you can put a container on the ship. It's like just another metal box that makes no sense. And uh, what actually happened is that this, this is a typical port before the containers when everything is loaded manually. And this is a Rotterdam port today, which is obviously everything is containers, right? So there are millions or tens of millions of containers moving around. And this is basically the story, is containers uh, they started some kind of revolution. So we are about 60, 70 years after the first container started, and actually when Malcolm McLean created a new container, it wasn't the one that we are using today. It was still a metal box, but it was very different. And he, in the beginning, when he created that metal box, he only wanted to reduce the cost for his own shipments within US, from one US port to another, or he had multiple lines, but essentially he wanted to reduce the cost of loading the cargo on the ship and, uh, and unloading on the destination port. And in the beginning, in the 60s, there were no container ships. All the ships were essentially the normal ships where you just manually carry things in. So in the beginning, he bought a bunch of uh, uh, post-war military ships, cargo ships, and redesigned them to carry containers. In the beginning, it was something like 150, 200 containers. Of course, he had to redesign the piers and the ports, uh, or redesign the ships, and then redesign the cranes. He actually didn't, there were no cranes to put on the pier. And later on, also the ports changed, and then trucks and trains. Essentially, the idea was to create um, simplify and make cheaper the uh, shipment of goods from the factory all the way to, uh, to the consumer. So, so far we're only talking about infrastructure, right? So it's a it's container, then, then the things around the container, and then uh, how you ship from the factory to the ship, and then move it to the other side. Now, at that point, it's pretty obvious that people who are actually manually loading the stuff into a container, they're going to lose their jobs. Although it was way faster than anyone predicted, but it was very easy to predict. It's like 
yeah, now there is a crane position. And, and before that, it took uh, three days and 20 or 40 people to load a single ship. And now you can load 10 times more within uh, 24 seven, uh, hours. Then what started happening was that uh, actually the areas around the ports, for example, San Francisco and New York, Manhattan was actually a port. So lower Manhattan was a port. And uh, all these factories started moving out inland into all kind of uh, uh, central US states. And that's because if you have a thing to ship from, I don't know, from Denver to, to New York or from Manhattan to the port, the cost is almost the same. Although it's, uh, I don't know, 2,000 kilometers or whatever, it actually doesn't matter because it's so cheap. And all these areas around the ports, all the people who were, but actually Manhattan was mostly uh, populated by people who were working in the port. They all lost their jobs. They all, um, not all of them, but a lot of them lost their jobs, and they just moved out. And today, obviously, Manhattan and San Francisco are residential areas. But then something interesting happened that no one really predicted, and it took people by, by surprise. The factories, until that point, still were producing the same thing, the same one big thing. And then they started specializing. So essentially, it was cheaper to say, for example, if you are building a Barbie doll, uh, before this change, before the containers, you would build everything related to Barbie doll in the same factory. Because it wasn't really reasonable to ship things around. Today, actually, Barbie doll build in all kinds of places. The hair is built in one place, the body in another, the, uh, the packaging is done in another, and then it's shipped to all kinds of different countries. It doesn't have to be China, but it's all kinds of different uh, places because it's actually the economy of scale basically means that it's cheaper to produce hair for all Barbies or dolls in the world in the same factory based on some kind of specification. So this led to creation of supply chains. So actually, supply chains started uh, becoming a thing in the 80s, just about 20 years after introduction of containers. So within 20 years, the entire infrastructure, the entire shipment infrastructure of the world changed. All the trains changed, the trucks changed, the ships, the cranes, and actually, production and distribution of everything is different. So it was, and it's, we're not talking about software, we're talking about actual physical world with boxes and physical things. And this whole thing changed within 20 years. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today mainly is about supply chains and how, uh, yeah, so supply chain is essentially, is, is not about a single company. It's about uh, multiple companies creating uh, higher value to a user altogether. So it's not about minimizing cost for one specific company, but it's optimizing the entire supply chain. And I'll talk a bit more about supply chain, what it actually means. Uh, but again, the reason for creation of supply chain is is basically the reduced cost on shipment. So before the containers, shipping a single ton of cargo was almost $6. One ton of cargo, $6, because it, it had to be loaded manually. Today, it's 16 cents. Essentially, it's, uh, it's more or less nothing. It's more or less free. So the overhead on 20 ton containers is uh, 3 euro or oh, dollar. Uh, so before supply chains, everything had to be done in-house. And even if you had a complex system like a car to build, for example, uh, Henry Ford, when he built the uh, Model T, he famous obviously for creating a forced production system when he produced a uh, massive amount of Ford T cars. He actually, at that point, owned steel mills, rubber plantations, and, and, uh, and actual trees, forests 
right? So actually, Ford com company own forests to be able to ensure that everything that they need to build a car, they actually have it in the right time and the right place. Uh, today, Ford doesn't own more or less anything or doesn't produce anything. Most of the things within Ford cars are things produced by other companies. Essentially, they're orchestrating thousands and thousands of different companies to produce one single car. Uh, those, those are 25 biggest supply chain companies today. And they basically, they look the way they look today because of containers. And if you see, is some of them are distribution companies like Walmart or Amazon, but many, most of them are product companies. Cisco, BMW, Lenovo, Intel, those are product companies, but essentially their main business is to orchestrate thousands of supply chain uh, components and make sure that eventually there is some kind of product at the end. So almost none of the, their products is produced in a single factory. They are going around, for example, uh, there are weird stories like uh, in Scotland, they actually, uh, they, uh, uh, they uh, fish oysters, right? So, but peeling oysters is actually quite labor intense thing. So what they do, they freeze them, they send them to China to peel them, and then they send them back to eat, right? So it, it's cheaper to send it to the other side of the world and then back than peeling them using local uh, Scottish labor. So this, uh, this essentially allows creation of uh, huge distributed supply chains. So all this was a background to basically uh, set up the, the context for, this, for the real story, which is software. Of course, I, I, I was leading to Docker, which is uh, uh, not really, uh, Docker didn't really invent a container, but the same way as uh, uh, Malcolm McLean made container useful, Docker essentially did the same for software containers. So you can package your stuff in boxes and ship them everywhere and then uh, uh, using containers and other technologies, you can actually, uh, let's see how it changes the world. So first, of course, there are containers. And again, Docker is not the only one. There are potentially other containers. And it's very obvious today that it's easier to package the thing in a container, same way as it was easier to package stuff into physical container. And then in the last couple of years, there was a kind of a buildup of the ecosystem around it, meaning all the tools related to containers, which are networking, storage, orchestration, all kind of other things that just support kind of like cranes and, and ships and all this uh, basic infrastructure stuff around the container to be able to actually use it. And the third level are being able to use essentially ship those containers across different clouds or data centers. So this is more like the distribution and uh, the yeah, actually cre uh, being able to package your software, run it in, on large scale, and distribute across different data centers. But that's about the end of current development of this ecosystem. All right, so it means that it's very obvious that uh, containers are replacing virtual machine of machines or physical servers. And running software in containers is just way easier because you can uh, restart them quickly, you can deploy them in all kinds of places, you can use, uh, for example, uh, Mesos or Kubernetes to uh, start thousands or, or tens of thousands of containers in different places. This is all happening now, so it's obvious that operations, for example, are operations departments are going to change, and we'll, we obviously see more and more DevOps teams that uh, do more development than operations. But what's next? Right, so we only get to the 
third circle. So how the factories, what are the factories in the cities? And of course, I don't really have an answer, right? But uh, I can assume that companies like Facebook or Google are kind of cities in software world, or factories, or something like that. Or it, it, what is fairly easy to see is that those entities, the companies, become more and more distributed. So 10 years ago, it was difficult to build software in a distributed way, because it was difficult to ship software. It was much easier to be in the same office and work, work on the same uh, on the same core, uh, in the same location. Even if you had larger companies that were distributed, it was essentially a bunch of different factories. Today, factory is virtual. Today, some companies don't have any offices, and they all work in a very distributed way. And the reason for that is because you can run software everywhere all the time, and you can share the things. The cost of sharing software in development or runtime is almost zero. Same way as uh, when you build physical things. And specialization, that before we actually move to specialization in software, there is kind of step back into physical world. So this is arguably the first car from 19th century. It's not really the first car, but close enough. And it is all built manually. Every single piece is built manually. It's assembled manually. It's not a mass production car. Also, those cars, those are cars from the beginning of 20th century. century. They are built in a single factory, but a sin single manufacturer. Uh, and essentially, they, all the components are built in the same factory. And this is how reasonably modern car, look, car looks like. So this is Ford, uh, sorry, uh, Volkswagen Golf from 80s, 90s. And also, all the pieces going into that car. Right? It's uh, thousands of different pieces. And the reason, the major reason that allows creation of each one of these components by different company, each one of them is created by different company in different piece, pr parts of the world, is because it's very easy to define physical things and define specs. That's what Simon was talking about earlier in the keynote. He said, in a software, we actually don't have things like that. So this is a bolt, obviously. It's very easy to see. It's a bolt, right? And the specifications are, are very precise. So if you do something like that and you publish it to multiple possible suppliers, they may come, multiple suppliers may come with a bolt that is exactly that. And you can take some of the bolts from one company, some from another company, and then using your production system. This is the only way to ensure that your supply chain is capable of producing consistently the same pieces to produce final result. Because if one of the supply chain components is failing, for example, one of the companies is going bankrupt, it, it's, it's huge risk for a company. That's why Ford, at that point, owned uh, forests, because they were afraid that uh, somebody would just raise the prices unexpectedly. So that's how architecture of software lo looks like in better places, something like that. But generally, this is the story of software development. Who, who never saw this picture before? Yeah, it's, it's very famous, right? So actually, the way the software is defined and produced is not very well defined, actually. It's not when the client asking for something, he's getting, he's getting something else. Now, imagine every single piece of it, of this car, is produced like that. It kind of fits, but not really. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a website called, forgot, the, uh, actually, it's called Pro projectcartoon.com, and uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a website, and they have like 20 of those things, and you can combine the story from it. Actual, yeah, anyway. So, now imagine those, each one of them is kind of, kind of it, but the wheel, are like, one of them is, is square. Why? 
because we misunderstood the requirements. Right, so that's, that, that's not acceptable. And, and software world, world is changing. So it's, uh, uh, that's why uh, there are these new technologies that may help in this, uh, in this story. So who, who knows what Swagger is? Thank you. <laughs> uh, and also, if you don't know, those icons are serverless uh, on, this is called Lambda on Amazon, this is called, called Functions on Azure, and this is Google Functions. And also serverless uh, technologies, so essentially you can execute a piece of functionality, essentially a function, a, a piece of code, without taking care uh, of infrastructure at all. Essentially you ship the piece of code, it's executed, and, and you get back the result. And if you connect it to Swagger that defines APIs in programmatic way, essentially you can create pieces of functionality that you can outsource, same way as you can outsource pieces of that car. So you can create a definition of a thing, and then somebody can produce it and, uh, and sell it to you, and then you based on that you can assemble a full, fully functional software product. Now, said that, those technologies actually don't do that, right? It, they, they kind of, that, that, you would assume that they would do that, but actually they are very much really, uh, intertwined and, and attached to clouds themselves. But possibly in the future we'll have technologies that will allow execution of safe piece of functionality, for example, uh, a grip. A grip function that you can take or buy from a provider and execute on, uh, in your website or on the IoT device or any, anywhere. When those technologies will become truly, uh, uh, they, they will be able to run on everywhere, then essentially we can create proper supply chains. Supply chains like this, which every single component is done by a different company, and you know what you get. So if you order a, an engine, a wheel, or a boat from another company, you get exactly that. And that would require a creation of specifications that are precise, the same way as in the, in the physical world. Uh, yeah, so I, of course I didn't really invent this story. This story is, is fairly commonly used, for example, companies like Sequoia, which is one of the biggest uh, venture capital companies in the world. And they're essentially saying that uh, every generation of IT innovation, we, we see the, uh, the infrastructure divides like cells, and it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And of course, there will be next one, and then next one, and next one. It's not going to stop. So every time, there will be something else. And every time there is a division like that, for example, transition from physical server, from, from, uh, from mainframe to uh, physical servers, to virtual machines, to uh, containers, and then later possibly to unikernels or functions or some other new technology, then every time there will be dramatic change in the way we build software. Uh, so essentially the software becomes so complex that we need to divide it. It's just not possible to build a single piece as complex as some Google products or Facebook or Twitter. They are just too complex for, for a single monolithic application. So we will need to divide them and then combining the bigger components uh, just to be able to create additional layers of uh, complexity. So this is mostly based, a story mostly based on those two books. The first book is called The Box. It's actually the story of physical container. This is the story of Malcolm McLean and his company. And uh, in, in a way, he succeeded to change the world, but personally, he, he actually sold few of his companies for a lot of money, but eventually he went bankrupt. 
and the containers he built and the ships and everything that he built was never used. I, I mean, it was used by his company, but when they had to, to define a standard, they adopted a different one and not the one he created. And when you read this book, it's very obvious that the, next read, uh, the next book to read is a book about supply chains. Because containers was the main reason for creation of supply chains. And what's next? Right, so this is the physical world. And of course, physical world right now is in a stage of supply chains and mass production. But it won't stop, right? That there's something else is coming also to physical world. There are three things I would like to mention in this. And I think they are fairly important, but there are probably others. So the first one is called mass customization. So what Ford did was called mass production. So essentially producing the same thing as many times as possible, as cheaply as possible which was fine, what it creates, it was essentially industrial revolution, based on industrial revolution engines and other things. What it allowed was to basically, today we can own almost anything we like. But because we, we are so rich now, and we can afford being unique, now we, do, we don't want the same car, we don't want to have uh, any type of 40 you like, as long as it's black. Right? We want different colors, we want different shapes. It's very annoying when you see somebody wearing the same, especially for girls, the same uh, 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 oh, Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, so what we want is mass customization. We, we want to be unique, we want to produce things that no one else has. It means that uh, mass production doesn't, doesn't work like that. So what we can do to actually allow it, another piece of technology is 3D, print, 3D printing. So you want to produce some, something unique. You don't have to, to actually buy it already assembled. You can download some kind of blueprint of a t-shirt, adjust it, and then print it. Actually, we cannot print T-shirts, but a cup or something like that. And today, for example, this printer is printing a house in China, right? It's a concrete 3D printer to just actually print a full house. Today, we can print with plastic, metals, concrete, and some other materials. But it's getting better. So it's, uh, it's, it's not used that much yet, this technology. But who knows what, where this came from? Yeah, it's called Ex Machina. Uh, it's, it's, it's a movie about artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is a big word, but uh, it kind of includes data management and learning, machine learning, and actual artificial intelligence. There are many things within that, but the point is that when we will have all this software, like we saw presentations from, presentations from Google today, it will change the world somehow. So the things that we will, we will get in the future will be different. Also, the previous presentation about data management is, uh, yeah, we, we can try protecting data, but it won't work for long. Right? It, will, it will go in all kinds of places. And then machines will learn how to use it and create the world that we cannot really predict. Uh, so how the company like Twitter will look in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah, possibly it will, it will not be a monolithic organization, like a single company producing a product. It will become a confederation of companies producing together uh, products uh, and create higher value to the customer all together, not as a single company. And potentially Twitter may become like automotive company that uh, instead of actually producing and owning every piece of code they have, 
they will actually consume those pieces of code from other companies and just assemble to, to ship it to the client. And that's it. Thank you. Questions for Pini? Okay, so I've, I've won. Um, you brought the bolt analogy, which tells you how big a bolt should be, and, uh, and that's sort of the standard, and then you get different suppliers built making that bolt. What if the metals used to make up that bolt are bad, so one rusts very quickly versus the other bolt doesn't, or one is heavier than the other? That, that's fine. So you can, you can put it as part of the specification and request sp certain material or not, and then you can buy cheaper or more expensive bolts. It's market forces, right? So you, you don't have to specify everything. You need to specify what you actually need, and everything else will manage itself using prices and free market. At least how, that's how it works in, in physical world, right? And, and so I, I think... Mainly the story is that uh, nothing is really new, right? Everything happened somehow in the past, just in a different way. So if you can identify the trend on some other, in some other story, then maybe you can see the future. Other questions? Thank you very much, Pini. Thank you.